With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, the statewide snowpack is at 80% of average to start March. And the San Joaquin Valley Dairy Producer Survey is now out. We'll have more on that. But our top story today. When I joined EPA nearly three years ago, I committed to working very closely with farmers and ranchers to identify practical, science-based policies that will protect our environment while also ensuring a vibrant and productive agricultural system. That's EPA Administrator Michael Regan speaking on Friday at Commodity Classic, held this year in Houston, Texas. There, he announced the new EPA Office of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. I'm excited also that this office will be led by Rod Snyder, who has served in my, as my senior advisor for agriculture since 2021. We have someone competent who's been on the job, coming into this job, and he's going to do an awesome job for not only EPA, but for all of you as well. With Rod's leadership and with the establishment of this new office, we will ensure agriculture and rural stakeholders have a continual seat at the table at EPA for many years to come. According to the office's website, its roles and responsibilities include increasing coordination with a network of existing agriculture policy advisors. It houses EPA's existing Farm, Ranch, and Rural Communities Federal Advisory Committee, which provides independent policy recommendations to the agency on environmental issues important to agriculture and rural communities. The new office will also work with the Office of Water to oversee the newly created Animal, Agriculture, and Water Quality Subcommittee. That subcommittee informs the agency's decisions on EPA's permitting program to reduce nutrients and water pollutants from animal feeding operations. Finally, it works with federal and state partners and the Rural Partners Network to collaborate with small, underserved towns and rural communities on federal investments and infrastructure upgrades and other community improvements. The Agriculture Secretary Friday said plans are for a meeting later this month between ag leaders within the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Rod Bain has more. Coming up later this month. I will have a trilateral meeting with the ministers from Canada and the secretary from Mexico, likely in Colorado. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack with the announcement Friday at Commodity Classic in Houston. He notes the importance of discussing and potentially resolving trade issues between the U.S. and two of its largest ag export markets. For me to continue to raise the concern we have in Mexico in their approach to biotechnology in terms of corn, and for me to also raise the need for Canada to continue to look for ways in which their dairy market can be more open to it. He added that recent cases on such issues before U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement dispute settlement panels are part of enforcement efforts regarding trade matters, among an overall strategy to increase U.S. farm and food exports. Reducing barriers, focusing on individual trade barriers that exist in countries around the world to our products. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. The nation's sugar farmers are in Washington, D.C. this week as part of the American Sugar Alliance annual fly-in. Michael Clements reports. Patrick Frischertz, a member of the American Sugar Cane League National Legislative Committee and a Louisiana farmer, says the event helps Congress know what's important to the sugar industry. We're here with the American Sugar Alliance, who represents American sugar producers, processors, and workers to advocate for a strong and stable sugar policy in the farm bill. For producers like us, that means we need a reliable safety net and a level playing field, which is what sugar policy supports. Importantly, because subsidy payments are not a part of the policy, the program operates at zero cost to the taxpayer and helps keep sugar affordable for our customers. Our goal is to maintain our farms for future generations. We also want to support American jobs and American consumers that depend on our industry for a vital homegrown supply of sugar. We can do that thanks to strong U.S. sugar policy. Frischertz says it's important to maintain a level playing field for American sugar producers. Well, the sugar industry plays a vital role in our economy. We are 11,000 family farmers who generate more than 151,000 jobs across more than two dozen states. We rely reliably deliver over 70% of the sugar consumed in the U.S. We pride ourselves on being efficient and competitive farmers, but no farmer can compete against foreign governments dumping heavily subsidized sugar into the market. That's where the farm bill comes in and why we need a strong sugar policy that prevents this market manipulation from destabilizing the U.S. market and destroying American jobs. He says the sugar industry has a great story to tell. We're always encouraged to see that there's such support from sugar policy across the political spectrum. At the same time, we don't take that for granted. It's important to educate policymakers about where our sugar comes from and why it's so important. 
Our industry has built a strong and resilient supply chain. The sugar is stored and distributed from 90 strategically located facilities. It's ready for delivery whenever it's needed and readily available on your grocery store shelves. All Americans benefit from having strong domestic sugar production, and we are honored to come here and deliver that message. Looking ahead, he outlines the next steps for the American Sugar Alliance and the sugar industry as a whole. Yeah, our big focus right now obviously is the Farm Bill. That's where we'll continue to engage with policymakers here at the federal level. We also always make sure to invite members of Congress and their staff to come visit our farms so they can see for themselves the work that we're doing. Obviously, we're proud of what we do on our farms. That includes expanding our sustainability efforts. Better sustainability includes higher efficiencies, good farming practices, and embracing advances in technology as they become practical at the farm level. Uh, This ensures our industry remains competitive and resilient for generations to come. It keeps the great tradition going and meets customer and consumer expectations. Learn more on the American Sugar Alliance website at sugaralliance.org. Michael Clements reporting. In today's National Spotlight, the United Soybean Board has a new CEO. Chad Smith has more. Lucas Lynch is the new chief executive officer for the United Soybean Board, which represents the half million U.S. soybean farmers and aims to create value through research, education, and promotion investments. He's excited about the new role and feels his background has prepared him well for leading the board's 77 farmer leaders across over 30 states. First off, I'm just very thankful to be in a role like this, you know, from a family farm in South Dakota, studying at South Dakota State University in agriculture, undergraduate there and a master's at University of Minnesota Carlson School of Business. But more importantly, I've had the opportunity to lead in the last number of years, most recently as executive vice president, part of the national leadership team at Dairy Management Incorporated. And then prior to that, I worked as the CEO of Midwest Dairy, which is the state and regional system of dairy checkoff. And probably most important launching point was serving as South Dakota Secretary of Agriculture from 2013 to 2016. Lynch says there are opportunities ahead for U.S. soy. The great thing is, is when you're a CEO of an organization, it isn't about me. It's about the board. It's about the farmer. And I trust the farmer voice. And the farmer voice and leadership of our volunteer board of directors has made investments critical to innovation. With over a thousand plus products in the marketplace today, from turf to tires, you name it, everything in between, the innovations seem to be endless. And that's fantastic for driving not only volume, but the most important part of that is value. We can talk about having a global marketplace, but getting access to that global marketplace is essential. Chad Smith reporting. To advance both genetic traits and commercial uses for industrial hemp, collaborative research is needed to develop new varieties and find favorable factors. Here's Rod Bain. The potential of industrial hemp as a multi-product crop is vast. If you ask Zach Stansel of USDA's Agricultural Research Service, Yet this geneticist acknowledges there's still a lot of challenges that we have to overcome. After all, industrial hemp was categorized as a controlled substance for nearly 50 years until legalization of industrial hemp for agricultural purposes occurred through the 2018 Farm Bill. And in particular, from the research aspect of industrial hemp, there is much catching up to do. Hemp research is decades behind where it could be. And that, to me, implies we need to come together as a community and to crack open a lot of these questions and challenges with hemp as a team, as a community. Questions such as best hemp cultivars to breed for desirable traits, such as drought resistance and how pollination efficiency can be improved. In the latter case, hemp is pollinated not by insects, but by wind. One thing that's been incredibly challenging to us is how do we exclude pollen during a routine seed regeneration? Our current approach is to use specialized growth chambers where we can have confidence that we're filtering out any unwanted pollen from the air. We're also developing this technology called the hemp hut that allows us to exclude pollen in a field condition. Stansel's observation of hemp research involving a collaborative approach is actually coming to fruition through developing projects and relationships. Stansel's facility in New York State works with other ARS labs across the country. Some of our closest collaborators are NCAUR in Peoria, Illinois, helping us evaluate thousands of individual plants for cannabinoids and terpenes and other molecules. We're also working with 
in New Orleans, an ARS lab that specializes in fiber quality. They've worked a lot with cotton in the past, but they're retooling their pipeline to work with hemp right now. Stansel's ARS lab is also working with researchers at nearby Cornell University and other land-grant university labs to replicate work to better understand genetic diversity in hemp. We have very close collaborators at Washington State University, Oregon State University, UC Davis, Alabama A&M, Louisiana State University, University of Wisconsin-Madison. All of these groups are pushing really hard and we're exchanging lots of seeds and other types of genetic materials to accomplish this work. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. That's today's National Spotlight. Now here's Will Jordan with the Livestock Report. In today's Livestock News. The initiative is called Your Farm, Your Footprint. PDP board member J.J. Pagel talks about why the dairy industry needs a program like this. What I really like about Your Farm, Your Footprint is it's a proactive move to continue to position the U.S. dairy as a preferred supplier of global dairy customers who hope to reduce carbon emissions and cut methane by one half by 2030. We have our customers we're talking about are Nestle, Danone, Starbucks. Those are ones you hear about and they've been very upfront that they are looking to become more sustainable and cut their carbon footprint in half by 2030. He talks about how this effort is different from other initiatives aimed at lowering dairy's environmental impact. What I really like about this one is it's a farmer-led initiative. It's a group of dairy farmers that got together, created a pilot program to really get the sustainability conversation up and going. It's not something that's been forced on dairy farmers that we have to do this. This is something that farmers are leading the pack on taking this to the next level and bringing this to our processors and our customers because we understand in order to compete in the global market, we need to have these things put in place and prove to the global market that we are the most sustainable U.S. dairy products in the world. The continual improvement plan includes practical recommendations for each specific farm's data. We input a handful of data metrics and our nutrient management plan, what we're doing as far as tillage, and then we get some numbers back. So we'll get our carbon footprint score back, and then they'll put it into layman's terms where you can look at it. For our farm as an example, we say the equivalent emissions of about 686 passenger cars on any given day. When you look at how much soil was saved with erosion loss and how much emissions were sequestering there, it's about 963 metric tons or the equivalent of 48 dump truck loads. So it's pretty neat that they put it into a very simple, understandable metric so that when you talk to people about it, they can understand it. PDP is expanding the opportunity to dairy producers nationwide. We'd like to build on the success of the 2023 pilot and invite all dairy producers from all geographies all across the nation to participate in your farm, your footprint. What was really cool about ours, we had dairy farmers from 145 cows to 5,000 cows in our pilot. So there's a little bit of everything for everybody and everybody to collaborate. Also, it's confidential. Your score is yours to do what you need to with it. So if you're interested in taking part in your farm, your footprint, please visit the Professional Dairy Producers website at pdpw.org and look for the Your Farm, Your Footprint button. Again, go to pdpw.org for more information. Chad Smith reporting. I'm Will Jordan for Agnet West. This is the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson, and we will be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Hours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's Agnet West headlines, here's Agnet West Farm News Director Brian German. The Department of Water Resources just completed the third manual snow survey of the season. Water Resource Engineer for DWR, Andy Rising, provided the readings from the measurement taken at Phillips Station. Our survey today, we recorded a depth of 47.5 inches, about 4 feet, um, and a snow water content of 18 inches. That's about a foot and a half. If you took 48 inches, melted it down, that's essentially 18 inches of liquid water that we're standing on right now. And that results in about 77% of average for this date here at Phillips Station and 74% of the April 1st average. So looking at our automated snow sensor network this morning, our statewide snowpack is at 80% of average, so about four-fifths of what we'd expect normally at this time. And a month ago on February 1st, right here at Phillips, we were only at 58% of average. Statewide snowpack was just 54% of average at that time. 
The American Seed Trade Association led a delegation of seed industry executives from companies like GDM, JR Simplot Company, and Pairwise on a week-long trip to Japan. The trip aimed to strengthen collaboration with Japanese counterparts and explore the role of genome editing in plant breeding programs. Meetings included discussions with government officials, participation in technical seminars, and media outreach webinars. The executives emphasized the importance of genome editing in addressing agricultural challenges and highlighted Japan's leadership in implementing innovation-friendly regulatory frameworks. They underscored the need for sustained investments in agriculture sciences and advocated for the use of all breeding tools to bring improved varieties to market. The trip demonstrated the need for continued innovation and collaboration within the seed industry. Big policy priorities could be pushed through at an accelerated pace with it being an election year. Almond Alliance CEO Aubrey Betancourt explained how the Congressional Review Act could impact administrative changes in the coming months. Any administration in an election year that's anticipating a potential change of administration want to get things done or through process and a formal process before September because of the Congressional Review Act, which requires that any policy that's pushed in post-September into a swearing-in, so just over 100 days from a swearing-in of the next administration, anything that's done in that 100 days can be pulled back by the next administration administration because it's seen more as political. It doesn't have to go through formal rulemaking, doesn't have to go through formal process. It's just seen as, hey, this was done at the 11th hour and we need to claw it back and start over. Whereas anything done before that 100 days, if it were to be clawed back or changed, would have to go through an entire formal process. So watch the bureaucracy almost speed up here. Researchers are looking for industry participation to better understand energy and water use on California dairy farms and look for better manure management strategies. Dairy Farm Advisor Jennifer Heggie described how dairy producers can help contribute to the project being supported by the California Dairy Research Foundation. There is a survey currently out to all dairy farms in the San Joaquin Valley, which is where about 90% of our state's milk is made. Postcards were mailed in late January with a QR code to answer the survey electronically so folks can check their mail. Or I would be happy to send the electronic link to those dairies that don't remember seeing the survey or just want easy access to it. Folks can email me at jm. H-E-G-U-Y at ucdavis.edu, and I would be more than happy to share that link out with Jerry's who would like to answer the survey. The UC IPM team will be hosting another series of webinars over the coming months. The UC Ag Experts Talk webinar series is designed for growers and pest management professionals and will focus on various pest management and horticultural topics for crops grown in California. The March 13th webinar will highlight various insect pests of alfalfa and how the widespread geographical areas with varying growing conditions can lead to different pests at different locations. The April 3rd webinar focuses on Asian citrusillid and the development of the ACP biocontrol program with parasitoids imported from Pakistan and the massive impacts they've had on ACP populations. The May 8th webinar will go over work performed to monitor the western grape leaf skeletonizer using an optical trap and the traditional delta trap. More information about the UC Ag Experts Talk webinar series is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. Continuing mentorship opportunities for women in ag. That's coming up on this Land of Hours. Alltech is continuing its partnership with the Women in Food and Agriculture program. Applications are open for new mentors of either gender and for female mentees from across the global food and agricultural sector. Now in its fourth year, the Free to Join program is dedicated to supporting women across the global food and agriculture sector by providing invaluable mentorship opportunities. Surveys suggest one of the biggest hurdles to success for women in the global agri-food industry is a lack of mentorship opportunities. WFA matches applicants based on their preferences, which can include mentor gender, areas of expertise, language, and industry sector, and offers of opportunities for women in food and agriculture to develop meaningful industry connections. To date, the program has facilitated 562 pairings, connecting mentees with experienced mentors. For more information, go to wfa-initiative.com. This is the Agnet News Hour. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Now here's Chuck Zimmerman. I'm visiting with Amber Lusink with TrueTerra. And first of all, Amber, tell us what you do. 
Hi. Yes. So I work for Truterra. Truterra is a subsidiary of Land Lakes, and so we are the sustainability arm of Land Lakes. And so at Truterra, I get to execute our Climate Smart grant. So Climate Smart is becoming a more common phrase in the ag space, and specifically with farmers. And so Truterra was a recipient of one of the Climate Smart grants from USDA, and so now we are executing on the, those opportunities. Yeah, I wanted to talk about you know this financial assistance program. Tell me. Uh, how does it work? What's it for? How does it use? Financial assistance program is one of our first programs that we're able to roll out under the Climate Smart Funding, and it's super exciting because it's really what Truterra is founded on is meeting the farmer where they're at in their sustainable journey. And so, whether that means you know a farmer is just now trying things out and they want to try things, but trying uh, cover crop or, or reducing your tillage to strip till or no till that can be scary and so we want to work with the farmer and provide that technical assistance but now we're also able to offer financial assistance so while we can't completely mitigate all of the risk for the farmer uh, we want to work with them we want to walk with them and then provide that financial assistance to to reduce that burden and honestly you know reduce that barrier uh, for the farmers to try these new sustainable practices since this started what last year how has that been going it's gone really well and like with everything you know uh, when you're trying something new you want to start small and that's what we've encouraged with this program Um, and that's how we've executed this program so we launched a pilot uh, in 2023 and we have 15,000 acres that are currently enrolled and going through that program and so we wanted to make sure we were doing the best thing for the farmers and um, you know if we needed to make tweaks along the way for the program to make sure it's you know the best thing for the farmer that's what we wanted to do and so uh, we're executing on 15,000 acres right now and then we'll we will be launching the remainder of our funding opportunity uh, in August. And so uh, that's a key date for farmers out there uh, is just to really look forward to August and, and we'll have some of these programs rolling out. With your program, how does True Terrace stand out or be the one that they choose? This That's what I get excited about is, you know, why Truterra? Uh, you know, Truterra is, like I said, a subsidiary of Land Lakes, and so that's something that is just really foundational to, you know, kind of our, our beliefs and our mission in terms of, you know, working with farmers. We work for the farmer. Uh, I work at Truterra, so I get a peek behind that curtain. I understand, you know, on our commercial side, you know, all of the different carbon programs that are out there, um, and I feel good about them. You know, I I, I truly know that we do work for the farmer, and so that's what's exciting about these programs. And what really makes Truterra stand out as well is, you know, our like trusted advisors across the country. So we work with our egg retail network. Uh, we understand that cooperative system, and so we work with our trusted advisors. And those advisors can work really one on one with those farmers. And you know, whether it's holding their hand or giving them encouragement, giving them recommendations, that's what sets us apart. Um, there's a lot of different climate smart opportunities out there, and I want all farmers to you know engage. And if Truterra's climate smart opportunity through the financial assistance program is is what works best for that farmer, you know, we'd love to work with them. Well, you mentioned how many acres I guess you have enrolled now, uh, but what's your like hope or expectation, uh, say, maybe in the next year? Yeah, so, you know, we're really looking forward, you know, there's a couple different opportunities. So we've been talking about financial assistance, and we'll be looking at roughly 80,000 acres of financial assistance opportunity uh, for farmers. And so that's a pretty considerable acreage uh, funding available. Uh, another funding opportunity that's really exciting is our early adopter. So those early adopters are those farmers that have been doing the right thing, right? Uh, they've been those long-term no-till. And until recently, there haven't been opportunities for those farmers and, you know, both commercial commercial programs. And, but then we have this Climate Smart Funding, right? So we finally are able to, you know, reward those long-term adopters for, quote-unquote, doing the right thing all the time. Uh, and so that's another really exciting program that we're going to be launching. We're going to be launching that first round here in the summer. Um, we'll be launching it regionally. Uh, but overall, we're looking at 800,000 acres that we, we will be working with uh, for our early adopter program. And so those are two of the really exciting things. And what that means is getting, um, you know, this Climate Smart funding straight into the hands of farmers to either incentivize them, um, reduce that risk uh, for that financial assistance, or reward them for doing, doing the sustainable farming practices, you know, all this time. What's the number one 
thing that they use the uh, uh, financial assistance for? Yeah, so the financial assistance is directly for, uh, you know, either reducing uh, tillage to strip till or going straight down to no-till or planting a cover crop. And so the program is tiered based on that. So, you know, there's there's different payment structures for that uh, based on if you're no-till or strip till uh, or if you're planting cover crop or if you're doing both. So that's, that's how the program works. And so, you know, that funding um, is really to offset the costs for that farmer. So if a farmer wants to, how do they apply for the program? So that's one thing, Trutera, we've worked really hard over the past few years is to try to make it really farmer friendly. We understand enrolling in programs can be cumbersome. Um, the data piece is cumbersome. That's a big hot topic and that's something that Trutera is really dedicated on. So honestly, going straight to truteraag.com, um, that's a great landing point. Um, you can go ahead and get into, we call it my portal. And so that is a one-stop shop for farmers to be able to create an account. Um, it's very simple. You can do it in about a minute. And then you can go in and you can upload your boundaries or draw your boundaries, fill out some very basic practice information, and then you can see opportunities that are available. Um, and then also understand, you know, there's going to be more opportunities launching in the summer. And so the benefit sometimes now is, you know, maybe in some downtime for farmers, they can go in and, and get their fields uploaded and get that information in there. And so then once the programs are available, they can see what opportunities they qualify for and really take advantage of them. So before we close, is there anything else you would like growers, customers to uh, know that we didn't touch on? Yeah, I, I obviously work for Chutera, uh, so I, I could be biased, but I just, I, I really uh, am very pleased with the programming that Chutera has come out with. I know it's a competitive market. I'm married to a farmer, and I'm, you know, he's also an agronomist, and so I, I see the confusion in the, the marketplace. Uh, I see there's so many different programs out there, and I can understand why it can be, you know, hard for farmers to really, you know, disseminate through all of that information, and so that's what I'm passionate about is that, you know, I just, I, I, this is the only program I'd probably let my own husband and our own farm participate in just because I know it's grounded on agronomics and, you know, it's really based on, you know, the foundation of Land Lakes and our cooperative system. And uh, that's what I get excited about. Thank you very much for taking a few minutes to visit here. We're at Commodity Classic. I'm Chuck Zimmerman reporting. This is the AgNet News Hour, and we will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the AgNet News Hour. For today's featured interview, I'm talking with Stanislaus County Agriculture Commissioner Linda Penfold. Linda, to start with, you are wrapping up your first year as the Agriculture Commissioner there in the county. Tell me, how has the first year been? Oh, it's been amazing. Um, I I feel I feel like it's been a great fit. I mean, I feel like I've been here forever, but in a good way. Um, in that, I, I feel like it's been just such a great fit. Um, I, I have to say, first and foremost, um, I just love ha- how strong the agriculture is here in Stanislaus County and how much um, the Board of Supervisors here really supports ag and the community really supports ag. Uh, there's a lot of history here. Um, me, there's a lot of farms that have been moved through the generations. So it's just, I just, I, I love how strong our agriculture is. And to me, I take that really serious. Um, but on top of that, I feel like I'm really blessed too with having a great office. My staff are, I, I, they're, they're some of the sharpest people I've got to work with throughout the state. Um, and they're very passionate uh, as well about serving growers and supporting ag and working with the public. Um, so, and, and they're very proactive. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of them. And um, I, I also really appreciate how creative they are in trying to find solutions for the jobs, for the work that we do. Now, even though you've only been in this position for almost a year now, you had a a long background in agriculture and in California agriculture, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, initially, um, I initially I came out to California in 1999 um, and I started out as an insect pest detection trapper for Sacramento County. And then uh, I moved over to Solano County where I started out as a biologist inspector there. Um, and from there, I worked for Solano County. I was uh, their pest exclusion 
Uh, I was a deputy, and I oversaw the quarantine pest exclusion programs for over 15 years. Um, <clears throat> in the course of that time, we went through uh, a number of important eradication projects. So uh, two medfly quarantines, uh, European grapevine moth, um, Egyptian broom rake, uh, glassy wing sharpshooter, um, yeah, a lot. I, I, I still, there's, there's more that I can tell, but uh, I loved it because I really got to work closely with the farming community there. Um, and then after that, I left uh, in 2020 and came over to San Joaquin County, uh, where I initially started out as deputy, but I knew there would be a lot of opportunity and uh, promoted up through uh, to uh, being the assistant commissioner. And then uh, about a year ago, um, I applied for the commissioner position here, and I'm fortunate that I, I feel fortunate and blessed that I was accepted to be the commissioner here at Stanislaus. So I've got, uh, uh, gosh, I've got almost 25 years working uh, in the California Agricultural Commissioner system. Yeah, and so with that comes a lot of, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, and uh, you've seen a, you've seen a lot of things, as you said. I have seen a lot of things, a lot of change. Um, the agriculture of today is definitely not like the agriculture that I saw 25 years ago. We are speaking today with Stanislaw County Agriculture Commissioner Linda Pinfold. And speaking yeah, of changes, let's yeah. talk about some things that are changing this year when it comes to uh, pesticides and things. What are we seeing new for 2024? All right, so there's been a number of, uh, you know, this, this past fall, there was a gamut of laws that were passed. Um, and um, before that, there was already some regulations that were in place. So one of the ones that was already in place, and I believe, you know, and most of the county ag commissioners, if not all of them, have really done a have really strived hard to uh, make sure growers were aware of what they call the certification and training regulations. And uh, so those went into full effect as of this past January. But the main reason those came into being was to harmonize California's certification system with U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's requirements uh, for pesticide certification. And so uh, out of this, the biggest thing that's really come into play that we've been working with here has been private applicator certification. So there is a new exam that came into being, and so that's the first thing is that uh, if growers haven't had to uh, have it recertified by taking that new certification, uh, that new exam, they have, to be, they have to do that before they can recertify. And then once they recertify, they'll be able to recertify using continuing education credits. Uh, as well, along those lines, um, it, used, it, it has been that when you've had your private applicator certificate, you had the credential to be able to uh, purchase and uh, use and store materials like aluminum phosphide and zinc phosphide for the purpose of vertebrate um, fumigation uh, control of burrowing vertebrates, so things like ground squirrels. And that's a really important uh, pesticide for, for folks in our county because there's a lot of almond and nut, you know, almond and walnut nut production in general. Uh, so they have to take, in order to be able to do that, there's also an additional, uh, they call it the burrowing vertebrate fumigant uh, certification that a person has to take um, in order to be able to get those pesticides. Otherwise, in order to do that, they would have to probably hire a pest control business to do that work. So that's been quite a lot. If I can just kind of take a side note, here in our county, my staff has worked very hard because we recognize that there's, um, well, the average age of the American farmer is 58 years old. And so we recognize that there's a lot of folks out there that haven't had to take an exam for a very, very long time, and having to take these exams has been scary. So we worked with Farm Bureau uh, we, uh, to, to develop a training program, and uh, so what we've been doing is we've been providing uh, refresher, uh, applica you know, refresher uh, classes and then followed by um, 
followed by people having the opportunity to take the exams. We've also partnered with our libraries uh, here in Stanislaus County uh, to be able to have the study materials uh, for the private applicator exams readily available uh, at their local libraries in both Spanish and English. So that's been, I think, locally, that's been a big, a big challenge for our local growers. Uh, but in addition to that, for our commercial applicators, those who hold qualified applicator certificates and qualified applicator licenses, uh, those who have categories L for who have had in, um, prior to twenty prior to January categories L, which is for wood preservation, M for anti fouling, N for sewer line root control, O for field fumigation, and P uh, for microbial pest control. Those categories have been eliminated effective January 1st, 2024. Uh, so now the new categories that uh, qualified applicators who hold the certificates or licenses, they have to take a new exam uh, depending on if they're going to be doing fumigation. And so there's going to be the new category, soil fumigation L, which is in effect, or non-soil fumigation, which is category M. Uh, what has been allowed, because California Department of Pesticides Regulations Licensing Division has been so backed up, um, and it's been quite a challenge for people to be able to get the, uh, take the exams and uh, get those moved through uh, California Department of Pesticide Regulation quickly enough. Um, many counties have been, you know, counties have been uh, authorized uh, to be able to allow uh, holders who have uh, those categories uh, to still be able to uh, use those for doing field or um, non-soil fumigation, you know, soil or non-soil fumigation, but they have to obtain their new categories no later than March 31st, 2024. After April, 20, April 1st, 2024, they're not going to be able to use those. With these changes in um, in, in the regulations as well. Uh, it's also caused increased requirements for what needs to be trained uh, and records that need to be kept. So, first of all, uh, one of the biggest change, you know, one change is that uh, all applicators, if they're handling restricting pest materials, uh, regardless of whether or not they're employees or family members, uh, they have to be at least 18 years old. Uh, but in addition, uh, there's been expanded training uh, topics. So uh, first and foremost, uh, it includes safe use information on the label where the training has to include the format and meaning of information on the label. Uh, training also has to include how to identify whether or not a uh, Pesticide is a federal restricted material or California restricted material. Uh, and for non-certified applicators handling restricted materials, the training also has to include how to identify if a certified applicator needs to be physically present during the use of the pesticide, uh, the certified applicator's responsibility to provide product and site-specific instructions, and the requirement for non-certified applicators to be able to immediately communicate directly with the supervising certified applicator. And as well, the requirements require for the training environment that the training location needs to be reasonably distraction-free. Uh, it needs to, the trainer needs to be present for the entire training, and the trainer must respond to employee questions. We will continue with Stanislaw County Agriculture Commissioner Linda Pinfold in tomorrow's show. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halverson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.